morning, Grace Church. <laughs> Is anybody else cold in here? It's freezing. Let's stand up. Let's warm up. Let's energize. We have an amazing God to worship in this room. Let's unite around the one thing we can all agree on, right? That Jesus is king and he is still on his throne. We're going to worship him in this room today. Can I get an amen? All right, guys, let's worship.
Amen. Good morning, Grace. All right, where are my Jesus followers at? Make some noise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I have decided to follow Jesus. How about you? Hallelujah. You made the best decision. I made the best decision. Well, welcome to Grace. My name is Lonzel Blackman. We are a church that, uh, that believes that everyone needs Jesus and everyone is our responsibility. Amen. Well, people of God, we made it to the second Sunday in November of 2020. Hallelujah. We've had a year, but God has been gracious and blessed us to see another Sunday morning. We're excited about that. Amen. Those of you that are visiting with us for the first time here in Grace, in the sanctuary, we ask that you would, you would fill out this connect card so that we can get to know you and, and love on you and help develop your relationship with Jesus Christ. Those of you that are watching online, you can actually fill out a connect card online. Amen? God is good. We're here to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Can we give God a hand clap of praise for His worship?
God's not worried, so why do I worry? God's not worried, so why do I worry? God's not worried, so why do I worry? God's not worried, so why do I worry?
Let's be a prayer. Open up my eyes to the things I've seen. Show me how to love like you. How love me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. God, we thank you. In this moment, this place, and this time, when we are well aware of everything going on in the world, and yet you call us to have peace. Lord, we believe it's possible. God, we believe it is possible to have a peace that passes all human understanding. Lord, we believe we're in this room today. Uh, we believe that we're watching online today because we were invited into this moment by the Spirit of the living God. And maybe you desire to impart some peace into us today. God, I thank you. Lord, as we open up your, your word and as we, as we go through this study for the next few weeks, I pray that this is not just head knowledge, but that this is heart knowledge, that we are actually changed, that we actually become a people who experience peace, that we actually become a people who the world experiences peace through us, God, that we are transformed for the purpose of making you famous in this world. God, we, we pray right now for a, a peaceful transition of power in our nation. Uh, we pray for all those who are involved. Uh, we pray a prayer over all of Washington, D.C. and everything going on there. Uh, we thank you for, for new doors that are being opened, God. We trust you in this time. And Lord, so we just pray for wisdom and for courage and for guidance and for, and for you just to take your hand and, and do whatever your will would have. And we'll trust you, God. Lord, I know you've got a word to speak in this room today. Don't let me get in the way. Just through the power of your Holy Spirit, speak through me or around me or in spite of me, God, however you want to get this done. Lord, we love you and we trust you and we thank you for what we will learn today. And we thank you for the transformation that will happen today. It is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is come by. Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. 
The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. I love the Bible Project. Like anytime I'm going to do a series or I'm trying to learn something in the Bible, that's always a great place to start. Tim Mackey does these amazing videos. I think there's one for every book in the Bible. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Morning, morning online. Uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Tommy Jones. I'm the pastor here. Would anyone like to guess what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks? Peace. That's right. <laughs> Peace. Um, and, and I feel like it's a good time to do it. I made a prediction a couple weeks ago. No one else saw this coming but me. I made a prediction a couple weeks ago. I said, after the election, I don't think everything will get instantly calm and back to normal. No one saw that coming but me. But I predicted it, and I was right. Um, peace. Like, shalom. This deep completion, this wholeness, this, this understanding that God is in control. It's, it's so amazing, so deep, so mysterious, and so available for us. Peace doesn't mean the absence of chaos, or there would be no peace in this world. Peace doesn't mean the absence of pain. It's this understanding that God is with me. Jesus Christ... Uh, through Christ, God gives us the gift of his life. And God, one of his names is Jehovah Shalom. And that means God is peace. And so if you have God, then you have peace. If his name is peace, if God is peace, and you have God, if you have given your life to God, then you have peace because you have God. Ergo facto, that's just the way it works, right? So, so let's just do this, because we know everyone who has God has peace. So I want everybody to shut their eyes real quick. Everyone shut your eyes. Now I want you to raise your hand if all you have felt for the last nine months is total peace. I'll give you another minute. Okay. You can open your eyes. Guess how many hands were up? Goose egg. The Razorback score in the first half. Goose egg. Not one hand. But that doesn't make any sense because we are God's people. We are, we are the people of God. And he is Jehovah Shalom. He is peace. And if we are God's people, then why don't we experience peace? It's like something is missing. And it's something we need. And it's something we're given. And it's something we're commanded to have. But so often it is so incredibly hard to find. Peace is hard. I mean, that's why I love the, the Dusty makes most of these graphics, and I love this. When you see how the word peace is kind of faded out, like that's on purpose because it's there, and I know it's there, but I kind of got to look to see it. It's not bold, and it's not jumping off the page. It's just kind of peace because we know it. I mean, we know this. We know about God, and God is peace, but yet it is still so hard for us to find. And God doesn't just want us to have peace. Peace is supposed to be our witness to the world. Like when the world looks at us, they are supposed to see the Prince of Peace. When the world sees us, they are supposed to see Jehovah Shalom, right? Do you think that's what the world sees? Something's missing. Something's wrong. When we sing these songs and when we gather together, I mean, it is supposed to, it's supposed to be a celebration of the peace we've experienced all week. For those of us who are in Christ, we're not just coming here to find peace. We're coming here to celebrate a peace that can't be taken away. But it doesn't always feel that way to me. Because something's missing. And, and I want to I say this. Um, 
For those of you who, who experience depression and anxiety, like medical depression and anxiety, you can often hear a message on peace or a series on peace, and you can just lump condemnation on yourself. Like you're just like, why am I not experiencing that? Like, like is it a lack of faith? Am I praying the wrong prayer? And the answer is no. You're a human in a broken world where anxiety and depression are real things. And we believe these are medical conditions just like heart disease or cancer. And they need to be dealt with in the same way. But I also want you to know this, if you are experiencing depression or anxiety, that does not mean that the promise is absent for you. And I'm telling you this because I know it. Guys, since around 2011, I have dealt on and off with anxiety. Uh, I've, I've had a few panic attacks. Oddly enough, I wrote this sermon on Monday. Monday, I wrote this message. And on Tuesday... I was uh, just getting up normal, going to work out, leaving the gym, and I had a panic attack in my car. And just overwhelming, if you've had them, you know what I'm talking about. It's an overwhelming feeling that I'm, I'm about to die. It's not, it's just, it's, it's complete anxiety. And, and I've been dealing with it since Tuesday, and you can tell I'm dealing with it because I yawn a lot. I go like that because I'm catching my breath. I've been to counseling on this. There's nothing physically wrong with me. There's just the way my body handles anxiety and stress is through... So people will see me and be like, he is so bored. I'm not bored. I'm trying to catch my breath. It's just the way. But, but in the midst of that, I have some anxiety that I'm dealing with. And there are times when I have to go to counseling. There's even times when I have to take medication. But in the midst of all those things, I have peace. Doesn't that sound weird? Then in the midst of those moments, e even on Tuesday when I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I'm even in the midst of that, I had a peace that passes all human understanding. So I know the promise is available for everyone. Because Jesus said, I give you my peace. I don't give as the world gives. The world pick picks and chooses who gets the peace. The world, does, you know, it's health, wealth, and prosperity. That's the peace the world gives. Jesus says, I want to give you something that's deeper. Something that's better. Something that's not bound by the rules of this world. And so the path may vary for all of us, but peace is available no matter who you are. And I want you to know the people that I'm talking to today, the people who I'm talking to about peace, are people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so I, I often do some messages for people who haven't, you know, and some messages. But today I'm talking to those people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ because I don't know how to find peace apart from Jesus. There are things I can tell you how to find apart from Jesus because I found them apart from Jesus. I can tell you how to do some things apart from Jesus. I can tell you how to have fun apart from Jesus because I've done that. So have many of you. I can tell you how to, uh, how to make money apart from Jesus, because I did that. Uh, I can tell you how to you know, play a bunch of PlayStation apart from Jesus. I can tell you how to make friends apart from Jesus. I can tell you how to use drugs apart from Jesus. I can even tell you maybe how to get clean off drugs apart from Jesus. I can tell you how to do a lot of things apart from I can even tell you how to have the illusion of peace apart from Jesus, because I had it. I mean, I, I've said this before. I was the happiest dead man alive. Because I thought I had peace, but I didn't understand it until I had real peace. And you're like, well, what's the difference? I don't know. What's the difference in a picture of a sunrise and seeing a sunrise? You just know when you know when you know when you have real peace. And I don't like saying things like I know when I know when I know because it sounds churchy, but I can say something churchy every now and then if I want to. I'm a pastor. It's about time. But like you just, you just know, don't you? Like, it's just something in you that's like, I am his and he is mine. And like I said, it's okay. It's okay, even in spite of everything going on. So I don't know how to tell you how to find peace apart from Jesus. I would tell you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're watching this today online or you're in this room and, and, and you've never done that, maybe Maybe today will be the reason why. John 14, 25, Jesus says, All this I have spoken while I'm still with you. Okay, he starts by saying, All of this I have spoken while I'm still with you. What do you think the wise thing would be for you to do when you go home today? If this verse starts off with, All of this I have spoken while I'm still with you, what might be a good post-church thing to do? 
Go read what came before. Right, because y'all don't, I mean, I could be leading you into some craziness. Go read what came before. It said, all of this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, that's capital A, that, that's a proper noun. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Amen. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control against all things. There is no law. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Like, that's peace. That's supposed to be what we have. And, and sometimes it's not. The arena, that peace, shalom, that peace, that completion, that things are right. That's what God gives his people. That's what God gives his people. And if, and if I'm you and I'm watching this, and I just want to hope maybe... Maybe today that there's someone watching or in the room who doesn't believe what we believe about Jesus Christ. And I want to hope and, I, and I'm praying that there's someone in the room or watching today who does not yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The problem for you is, I read all these verses about what peace is supposed to be, and your response is, I have not seen that from God's people. Right? That's your response. If you don't believe what I believe, you're like, Shh, yeah, I don't know. I've been reading Facebook for the last nine months. Those people are not peaceful. And then I have to say something like this. Oh, well, don't. It's not. We're not asking you to have faith in us. We're asking you to have faith in Jesus Christ. We're just poor executors. Your faith is not in us. Your faith is in Jesus. So don't mind the fact that we don't have any peace because we're asking you to put your faith in Jesus. And that is the biggest cop out we could ever say. Jesus said, I will, I will be in you, and you will be in me, and you will do even greater things than I did. And yet we're telling the world, oh, we're just broken little sinners. Just Jesus is my homeboy. Just look over there. Not Look over there. Ah! No. We were supposed to say what Paul said, look at me and see him. Look at me and see him. Look at me and see God. See Christ in me, Jehovah Shalom flowing through me. Like that's supposed to be what we're saying to the world. Not don't look at me, look at Jesus. They're like, well, he's kind of hard to see without you. Because we are Christ for the world. We're the body of Christ. And so this is something that I believe we need to work on. So why do we struggle with this? Why is it, by the way, just so we all know, not one hand went up. When I said, raise your hand, he said, why do we struggle with this? Why is this so difficult for us? If we know that God is peace, and we know we're meant to have peace, and we know the world needs us to have peace, why is it so difficult to do what we were actually created to do? And the problem as I see it is this. We want the promise of peace, but we don't want to do any work. We want the promise. My brother always says this. We want the promise without the premise. I say it better. I say, <laughs> we want the promise without the path. Because there is a path to peace, but you must be willing to walk it to experience the peace that's on the path. God doesn't just force peace on you. He empowers you to take a walk with him. And on that walk, what you will find is peace. Peace. But we, what we want to do is take that verse, you know, some verse about peace and stick it on the refrigerator and just pray it. God, give me peace. God, just give me peace. And God's going, okay. Here, it's, it'd, be like, it'd be like my buddy Weston over there. If Weston, if God was like, Weston, I want you to ride a bike. And I'm going to empower you to ride the bike. But first, I want you to put on a helmet. And Weston goes, I don't want a helmet. I just want to ride the bike. God's like, no, I want you to put the helmet on, and I'm going to empower you to put the helmet on, but I want you to put the helmet on, then I want you to ride, I want you to walk down there, and I want you to get on the bike. And Weston goes, no, I don't want the helmet. God, I just want you to thrust the bike under me and carry me around like E.T. when they're riding over the moon. And God's like, no, 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 you don't get it. You haven't read this book. Sometimes I'm going to ask you to do something, and I'm going to empower you. It is a free gift. The gift of, of Jesus Christ is completely free. 
but to experience the fullness of the promise, you got to be willing to walk down the path. And so I think there's a path that we have yet to walk. And so my, my hope is that um, we will understand that God has created a world with sowing and reaping. And you get what you give and you get out of it what you put into it. And if you want to experience peace, you must do something. John 14, I think it's John 14, 15. I think I got wrong last one, but it says this. If you love me, keep my commands. That almost sounds like a sort of a, a premise. right? That almost sounds like a context right there, a path right there. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Okay, so doesn't it sound like there's a lot of context around this promise of peace? Like peace is not the absence of pain. Peace is, is not the absence of chaos because Jesus said, I'm giving you my peace. And Jesus experienced some pain in this life, right? But he said, it, it, there's, there's context around peace. And if you want to experience peace, what must you do according to these verses? Obey his commands. Hold on, that sounds like a loophole. That sounds like when they say, you know, you, I'm giving you this Twinkie for free. You just must pay for shipping, which is $19.99. Nothing costs $19.99 to ship a Twinkie. I'm buying the Twinkie. There's context. Obey my commands and you will experience peace. My brother Jeff did a moderately decent job preaching on this topic last week. And he defined peace like, well, I'm, he defined it in a, in a good way, but I kind of rewrote it and made it better and simpler and easier to understand because his sounded like a scientist. So, <laughs> peace is this. Peace is experiencing the presence of God. Empowered by the Holy Spirit and being obedient to what God calls you to do. Peace is experiencing the presence of God, like knowing that. Is it, it's, have you ever experienced God's presence? Not known about God. Have you ever been in a moment where it was undeniable that God's presence was with you? Peace is experiencing that presence, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then being obedient to what God has actually called you to do, empowered. And through that, this is how we experience peace. Apart from this, there is no peace. Apart from keeping his commands, there is no peace. And our problem is we want the promise without the path. We want to experience his presence in some part of our life, but we don't want to surrender that part of our life to his presence. It's like, God, I want your peace over my finances, which I'm going to use completely to satisfy all my worldly flushes. So if you'll just bless that, then we'll be cool. And God's like, what? God, I want, I want your peace over my job, but I'm going to show up at least a half hour late every day, and I'm going to be a real pain to deal with, and I'm going to gossip about everybody, so just bless it. God is like, what? We treat God like, see if y'all can name this tune. What, what song is that? It's I Dream of Jeannie. That's how we treat God. Just, God, now bless these things, and I'm going to bless my marriage, even though, you know, we can't stand each other, and we're not nice to each other, and bless my finances, even though it's all about me, and bless my job, even though I'm a terrible worker. Bless all of these things so that I can experience the fullness of life, and God is going, that's not how it works. Surrender all those things to me, and I will give you peace in all those things. You give them to me, 
You lay them before the king, and the king will grant you fulfillment in them. He has no desire to fulfill something that does not belong to him. He wants you to give it to him. And when you do that, God will grant you peace in it. God is the ultimate respecter of free will, man. He will always, if you don't want him in some part of your life, he doesn't just come and take it from you. He, he's, he's, he respects your free will. If you don't want peace in your relationships, if you don't want peace in your job, if you don't want peace in any of those parts of your life, God will allow you to do what you want to do. But if you want peace in your life, you must surrender your life to Christ. And there is absolutely no shortcut around this. And I know because I spent about 25 years looking for the shortcut. So have some of you. Paul, who uh, actually was a guy who gave everything to Jesus. Let's listen to what he said in Philippians 4, 11. He said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Let me just hold on right there for just a second. Guys, Paul was beaten, shipwrecked, imprisoned multiple times. Uh, eventually he would die for the cause of Christ. He gave away wealth and all these things to have nothing to follow Christ. And, and then he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And what we want to do with that is just do this part. We just want to take this verse. I can do all the things I want because Christ is going to give me the strength to do them. I mean, people tell me this, and you've said this. It's like people try to bench press ridiculous amounts of weight with this sticker stuck. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he's like, uh, you can't do that. I can do all the things I want through Christ who will give me the strength to do what I want to do. And this is our interpretation of this verse. But what he's really saying is, I will give you the strength and the peace and the blessing to do all the things that I want you to do. So if you want to live in the strength of Christ, you have to do what Christ wants you to do. You can't just do your thing and then say, Christ, give me strength. He's like, strength to do what? What you want to do? You can do what I want you to do. And when you do that, the strength you have will give you a peace that passes all human understanding. And so, guys, if, if you want peace in some part of your life, the only thing I can think of is give that part of your life to Jesus Christ. And I'm not perfect in this um, by any stretch. Christy, my wife and I, she's, she's traveling. She's not here, so I can, I can say whatever I want. Like, We've, we've discussed certain parts of our life that we feel like God is calling us to do some things. And we hadn't done it yet. And we're like, you know, going through, and it's, it's the same thing you do. Let's spend the next 47 years discussing whether or not this is what God wants us to do, right? And so we're having these conversations, and because of that, there's still a part of our life where we don't have peace. Because I believe, and I think she believes, that there is still a part of our life that we have not fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. And if we were to surrender this part of our life, we would have less stuff probably than what we have now. And we might have less of the world's things than what we have now. And we may have some additional worries that we don't have now, but she and I both believe we would still have a peace that's better than anything we have now, but that step is still hard to take. But we're going to do it. And she's not here, so I can say it. Here's, here's the challenge as, as we walk into this series. What part of your life lacks peace? Like, where is peace lacking from your life? Is it in your relationships, in your job, in your finances? Is it with this political stuff? I mean, where is the peace lacking in your life? Because I'm willing to bet dimes to dollars that wherever the peace is lacking, that is the part of your life that is not surrendered to the king. So maybe today, maybe this week, you go home and you read some of these things and you get really, really honest with God about what's being held back from him. 
And as, as you begin to get honest with God about what you're holding back, you begin to take steps forward. And as you take steps forward, God begins to show you a peace you did not think you could have. As I do not know how to tell you to find this apart from surrendering your life to Christ. But there is a path. And peace is on it. And for those who will walk it, peace is exactly what you'll find. So I challenge you, get honest. And then start walking. And see where God leads you. Amen? Let me pray. God, I thank you. Lord, the world has yet to see the power and the authority of a man or a woman who would fully surrender their life to Jesus Christ. But what if, what if it were me? What if it were someone else in this room right now? What if it was someone watching online? What if it was my family? What if it was this house? God, why can't it be us? Why can't we be the ones to say yes to whatever the call is? God, we know the areas of our life where we are withholding our life from you. We know it. We know it. And we're expecting you to give us peace in it. And you clearly say you are not going to do that. And the world is watching. And the world needs to see a clear and compelling choice that is better than the world. The world needs to see a people of peace. So give us the courage. We have so many questions, so many things we don't understand because we can't see the full picture. And we have all the what ifs. But God, you, you just want us to believe that you're better. And it's, it's not like you're not offering us something better. Not one person in this room raised their hand when they said they had experienced complete peace in the last nine months, but you died 2,000 years ago. Why didn't the last nine months belong to you? Why shouldn't the next nine months belong to you? Why would there be any circumstance in this world that would have the power to steal the peace from Jehovah Shalom's people? So God, I pray we receive what's ours and start walking. I pray we pick up our mats and move. God, you love us and peace belongs to us. Lord, I pray this last song that we sing is true. Let these words be our message to the world. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. You guys stand and worship with me. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, what
there was a, a part of our ministry here where we did not have shalom, peace for a little bit. Um, many of you know that Clarissa Wallace uh, was our GC kids uh, person. Then she went full time to Grace Discovery. And so we had an absence there. We were trying to find uh, someone new to come in and continue on that legacy. And we looked for a long time. And then uh, oddly enough, we stopped looking and surrendered it to God. And then someone showed up. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I should write a sermon about that. Um, and so I want to introduce you guys to our new uh, GC Kids pastor, Deborah Mooney. Come on up here for me, will you? <laughs> Deborah, just stand down here. And <clears throat> yeah, so like it was funny when, when Deborah called me and said, I'm interested in the job. And I was like, What job? And she was like, The kids' job. I was like, Are you for real? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, well, tell me about your experience. That was a silly question. <laughs> because for those of you who know, she has a tremendous amount of experience. But as much as her experience is amazing, her spirit is even better. If you don't know this person, get to know her because you're missing out. Uh, but God has delivered, and I am excited. And so what I want us to do is do what we always do when someone begins a ministry here. Everyone hold your hands out towards Deborah, and we're going to pray over her. God, we thank you. You are indeed Jehovah Shalom. You are the God of peace. And you are our provider. And God, it is, it is not just cute church talk to say when something is surrendered, you will deliver. Because Deborah Mooney's standing in front of us right now. She's testimony to exactly what I'm talking about. That if we will give you a situation, you'll provide peace in it. 
And so, God, we thank you for Deborah, and we thank you for her family, and we thank you for the ministry that she brings and the experience that she has and the vision that's inside of her, God. And, and we thank you that, that you have brought us someone who will continue an incredible legacy of introducing children to a God who is active and attractive and loves us. God, I thank you. I thank you for that these kids will experience the Holy Spirit in a new way. They will experience love. They will experience peace and joy. God, I thank you that uh, generational bonds will be broken, that children will be set free, and that we will raise up a new generation, not of kids we want to keep safe, but of kids we want to unleash into the world as bold and fearless soldiers of the King. God, use her to win some. We love you and we trust you. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So guys, make sure you give Deborah a, one of the, an air hug or an air. Don't get her sick because we just got her. For real. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for giving. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of what we do. Uh, if, if you want to go home online, share this online. Get it out to more people. Let's show the people what's happening in this house. Go in peace and bring peace to the world. I'll see you next week.